All right, guys, so what is songwriting an example of? It's an example of storytelling, and any form of art can be viewed as such. And I like to compare the way music is constructed with the way film is constructed. So I'm going to show you a scene from one of my favorite movies. It doesn't make it a good movie, far from it. And after the scene, I want to talk about what it's lacking and why it feels so bizarre. Oh, Elliot, it will be wonderful. You and me in the woods. This time, we'll be able to be together for sure. And, and my boys? If you bring them with you, I never want to see you again. Okay, I'm going now, and I'll tell them. I'll see you tomorrow morning? At eight, on the dot. Okay. Elliot? Yeah? Alone? Of course. I'll see you tomorrow morning. Finally. Please, don't do this, Holly. We could have waited another 15 minutes. I'm sure he would have come. All right, so why does that scene feel so awkward? You can guess based on not, not having seen the rest of the movie that what, what is actually going on here is that she wants to have alone time with her boyfriend and she had anticipated spending time with him and it doesn't come together as shown in the scene where her family is driving with her and he is not there. But the two scenes are set up in a way where it's so fucking awkward because there's no transition from scene one to scene two. Uh, and, and it wouldn't have needed much. Even like a, a small fade out from the lens, just uh, something to showcase that it's different. And, and all of it is awkward. Going from there not having being any kind of like ambient sound to all of a sudden you hear that there's a moving car and the same actress from one scene is now in a car and you don't have an explanation as to why uh, the cut from her line before it is super abrupt and awkward and weird and then you just have this uh, immediate new scene. This, you know, this is not a, a good filmmaker. Um, th this is from Troll 2, which is, you know, an infamously bad movie, uh, but I could see the intent and there's plenty of times where you can see an artist's intent but also acknowledge the shortcomings and why it falls flat. This is an objectively bad movie. There are objectively bad examples of music. People don't seem to want to admit that. I don't know why you could say there's objectively bad movies and have a hard time saying like, oh, this band is, it's not whether or not it's bad, it's just you don't like it. There's plenty of reasons why music can be bad. And this is one of them the lack of proper editing, the lack of proper transitions. And it, what, is, what is a transition? What is the nature of a transition? By nature, it's superfluous. If you have two parts that are well put together and you could logically go from one to the next, you don't necessarily need it. And because it's superfluous, it can either be the most important part of your arrangement or your, your least important and biggest downfall. So. You'll see bands utilize, I, I got, the reason I'm doing this video is because there were people that were asking me to showcase examples of good transitions and bad transitions. And a lot of people think that it just has to do with flow, whether or not one part can flow into the next. And that's not necessarily true either. Uh, flow is, is, is very important. If you want to have one song go from A to Z naturally, obviously you're going to want to have uh, a good sense of flow going. You want it to feel organic. This is why a band like Opeth is really bad at songwriting because they, they have good enough good enough riffs, but he'll tr he, he won't understand how to bridge that gap and he'll just cut to a held open E chord and then go into a completely different passage and there's no reason to not denote that as two completely different songs. So, you know, uh, Opeth fans will love that band and not care about that because it's ticking the right boxes emotively for them. But the, you can't look at that and say, this is well put together music. It's not. It's, and if it's not well put together, it is by nature bad music. And, you know, a lot of people will have a hard time with that. And there's plenty of examples where 
uh, a song could naturally flow, meaning that the tempo won't change and the, uh, the, the notes that they use in a transition are, um, are, are going to fit, but it still will feel completely out of character. And the, it, it might feel out of character because the key is different or, or, or some, it feels like hackneyed, it feels like gimmicky. You know, even though it flows, it might step out of the comfort zone of the song in a way where it's very jarring. And it, it, it might flow in terms of tempo, but the melodic choicing might be weird. So it's, it's not necessarily about flow, it's about realizing that this is a, a segue from one part to another, and you have to give it utility. Because it's superfluous, that fucking better have utility, otherwise it weakens your whole structure way worse than having like a bad riff. Because if you have a bad riff, the next riff might save it. But if you have a bad transition, you may have a good riff and a bad riff, and then you've compounded it by tacking on something else that doesn't necessarily belong and doesn't serve the song in any way. So this is why when I looked at the, at the Chuck Schuldiner songs, you can pinpoint that it, everything changes from riff A to riff B in terms of tempo, flow, melodic voicing, whether or not the rest of the band drops out. And that can be done to an effective degree. You, if you want the next part to like hammer you like a speeding train, you can do that. But there's times where you could tell that like, you know, it's the typical suffocation style. You wanna add the next riff. So just have the rhythm section drop out and just play the riff with some accents on some of the some random notes here and there and then come into the riff fully it can be effective but when you realize that it's a trope when you realize it's a handicap you can pick up on the fact that the band has not really fleshed out their sense of how to use a transition and transitions are such useful ideas you can you can do it to foreshadow a part later on in the song you can give them a taste of what's to come just like in a movie you can give a clue of, of what the, the ending is going to be and then bring it back later fully fleshed out. You can take the, the first riff that you're exploring, change the key, give it a different emotional coloring and then bridge the gap between something that's consonant and something that's dissonant. That's, that's very effective. You can go from one tempo to the next by having like a soft uh, like tempo change in your transition. So you want to go from this speeding train type of velocity to a slow plotting riff. You can do that by having a gradual tempo shift within a transition. And it'll feel far more natural than if you just go A to B. And I'm going to show you guys in this video. And believe me, I can go on and on about this. And this does deserve a lot of time. But I'm just going to give you a few basic examples with the band Anata and the band Immolation showcasing how they have used transitions or how they have not used them, whether or not they have given the songs objective strengths or whether or not they have weakened the composition by not using it at all. So, so yeah, I mean, I have had people ask me about song composition, very basic questions, and people want to know about the nature of transitions. And they, they, are, they can give you so much in a composition that you can really add so many dimensions to your song. And what I like to do is, it, it, if, you, if you think about transitions, you might think that it's because someone has a cool riff and another cool riff, and they don't know how to tie them together, so they have to come up with something. And that may be true a lot of the time. The way I write, and this is anecdotal, uh, anecdotal I'm not saying that this is the way it should happen. You know, if you can come up with a grandiose artistic statement another way, that's totally fine. But if it's transparent, people are going to hone in on it. The way I like to write to make it feel as organic as possible and to showcase that what I want to bring forth in song, the emotion that I'm trying to captivate in the song, I, I usually write from A to Z. And there will be transitions in my songs, but I will deliberately utilize them to add color to the next riff or to showcase a different quality that you necessarily wouldn't have heard in the first riff, maybe to foreshadow an upcoming passage. Uh, all kinds of reasons. There's all kinds of reasons you like to do it. What I like to do is branch out of key to introduce a new riff in a completely different key. And you know, in music you don't hear a lot of key change, but if you want to 
keep a very succinct idea melodically, you could develop it with a lot of key changes and still have your song have a unique characteristic in and of itself without adding too many ideas to the pot, which will weaken your composition. So I'm just going to give you a few examples from these two bands, um, and we could take it from there, showcase what works, showcase what doesn't work, and I, I believe that after you look at what I'm saying, you'll be able to see that there are objectively bad arrangements, objectively bad use of, uh, of composition in terms of going from riff A to riff B, which will give you a compositionally bad song, an objectively bad song. Troll 2 is an objectively bad movie, and I love it, but it doesn't mean it's good. So I'm gonna showcase a couple of these uh, riff examples, and we'll talk about it afterwards. All right, so the first song I wanted to show you guys is Aim Not at the Kingdom High from Manada. This is the last song on their first record. And the first riff leading into the next riff goes from a 6-8 feel to an 8-8 feel, which is kind of difficult to do uh, in a fluid sense. And the transition that they utilize gives it a different emotional coloring leading from riff A, which is a little bit more sinister, sardonic feeling, a little percussive, to riff B, which is more melodic and triumphant sounding. So the, tra the transition is what glues it all together. So I'll show you that riff right now. So what's important to note there is that end tag. The, uh... So that kind of has a bit of a sardonic feel like, like Nelson from The Simpsons laughing at you. And uh, that ends up kind of being what the B segment of riff one ends in at the end of every phrase. So the riff changes to uh, getting rid of some of the melodic tension that is built in the first half of it and devolves into more of a percussive nature. So then it ends up going. So it ends up uh, repeating that tag. And the next riff they go into is So if they decided to not have a transition, here's what it would sound like. So it kind of works, but it still feels a bit piecemeal. What they do instead is instead of doing this at the end, they do this at the end. They give it a, a single picked arpeggio that has a little bit of a slowdown in tempo. And then when you end up going to the second riff of the song, it adds a bit of drama that isn't there if you just have the, the riff repeat the same way it always was going to. So it allows like the first like kind of sinister sounding riff to blend to the next one by having a little bit of a, a break from what ends up kind of feeling a little bit monotonous if you let that riff go the, the eight times that it does. So the full transition ends up being this. Kind of botched it. So you could see that it, it feels way more put together than if they would have went from riff A to riff B without any kind of palette cleanser, without a different emotional coloring, without a, a bit of a tempo fluctuation because these are two different tempos that they're trying to marry. And uh, I do feel that despite the fact that there is a riff one and a riff two uh, transition in between them, that it was deliberately planned out this way because it feels so fluid. It doesn't feel like they had a cool sounding riff here and a cool sounding riff there, and they tried to just piece it together. It seems like it flows naturally enough where it had a destination in mind when they started writing the song. The next song I wanted to talk about was Nailed to Gold from Immolation from the Here and After record. And if you have watched my other videos, you'll know that this is one of my favorite songs off of one of my favorite records. And I'm glad that I chose to focus on it today because I've never bothered to learn how to play on guitar uh, until about an hour ago. 
and uh, it's cool to actually have the song visualize itself to me. But uh, regardless of whether uh, of when I learned the song, I knew that the use of transitions in it uh, was done to great effect here. Uh, what what is being used as a transition in this song is the tag end of the verse riff, uh, and uh, the the verse riff is a is a very chaotic whirlwind of whole note passages, and it ends in a really discordant uh, tremolo pick chord. So I'll play you the first verse riff, and I, I learned this by ear, so it might not be great if you know the record. You know it's pretty hard to pick out what's going on, but this is what I think I'm hearing. <laughs> played it better the second pass through, uh, but that it's really hard. I have to cut my nails, but it's hard to nail that uh, minor second in there with that uh, sixth fret A string held. And then they go into this trem picked uh, stretch chord, which is really difficult to play. So that is really dramatic because Immolation did not like to adhere to um, kind of human feeling tempos. They fluctuate a lot, especially in this song. And uh, it just kind of flows really unnaturally, which really lends itself to the quality of the music. Uh, but that, uh, that kind of held chord passage, that discordant passage ends up being at the end of every phrase of that whole note uh, first riff. <laughs> And uh, then they go into the chorus riff of the song. So they're very good at giving you that contrast of emotions right away at the start of the record. Um, but after the solo, the solo culminates in uh, it, well, it starts off under the least melodically pleasing passage of the song, which is the very first riff of the song. It's a very ugly, sinister riff, which eventually builds to that chorus riff, which I just played, which is really melodically pleasing, uh, very consonant sounding. And um, after the solo ends, there's a bit of a vocal carry on over that riff until they give you that uh, harsh, discordant trem picked part. So coming out of the solo, you hear that chorus riff again. What happens during that that group of passages is uh, they they give you the drama that comes from that held <laughs> discordant chord, and before it was used as the end of a phrase, and now they're doing it as a transition into a new phrase, which is the first verse riff of the song. But instead of ending with that chord passage, they just give you the A part of the riff over and over and over again. So you find yourself looking for it. Instead of it culminating in the end, you get this over and over. And then they give you this dramatic pause where the drums hit a fill, and then it all culminates in that groove riff. Sorry, I'm not very comfortable with playing it yet, uh, but the, they could have went right into it. I'll show you what it sounds like if they would have went right into it. So it could work, but they give you that pause 
on purpose to build that, that to give you that kind of gasp of air that you need after such a frenzied passage. So the transitions here aren't aren't new melodies that you haven't heard yet in the song, but they they use familiar passages even though this is a very alien sounding melodic style they they make sure to use the passages that they've put in the song in creative ways to piece it together where it isn't so much a riff a riff b riff a riff b they utilize segments of those passages to give different characteristics to the melodic and anti-melodic phrases that you're going to be hearing later in the song so pretty successful use of transitions here so what I want to do now is to continue with the bands that I've discussed earlier, but showcase what happens when they don't properly utilize a transition to tie two parts together. Uh, Anata, who I've shown previously using transitions to a great effect, uh, later on in their career, in the last album, the title track, The Conductor's Departure, there are two parts that are in sorely need of something to tie them together. It goes from a very slow, imperial death march sounding riff that's built on octaves and power chords, and then there's a complete break where the rhythm section drops out, and it goes from a slow 4-4 four, four feel to an upbeat 6-8, and it's just too jarring. It doesn't work, and you lose that drama that comes from that slow plotting passage before, it, where it, you think it's going to build to something really triumphant, and it, and it just leads to a, a good riff, but one that doesn't really make sense in the context of the buildup that is happening before. So I'm going to show you those two riffs back to back. Kind of night and day riffing style, right? You would think that as they're putting this together, they would come up with something to tie those together. And it's I, I understand that there's going to be times when you want to have that sense of shock, that sense of drama that comes from going from one part to another completely. Uh, there's plenty of bands that I have seen that happen to great effect. But this being the first riff of the song, setting up so much drama and then completely dropping the ball, going into something completely unrelated, something that isn't, uh, uh, it doesn't have nearly the same vibe at all. Um, there's no, no real successful buildup to the logical next destination. This one needs work. And it's a shame that it happened so late in their career. And this particular song is full of my favorite riffs from the band. So it's kind of a shame that it's kind of haphazardly put together. Uh, so that's just one example I wanted to show of a song that is done by an artist who does know how to utilize transitions well. And uh, this particular song, to me, seems like they came at it from the perspective of, I have a few cool riffs. Let's just smash them together. And there wasn't a whole lot of forethought put into the arrangement as the whole. So let's go back to Immolation. Uh, one of my favorite passages from the band is the very end of Failures for Gods, which has a great mournful melody, but it is just smashed right up against the part before it with no transition at all. And the part before it has this uh, kind of like building nature to it. One of the most successful things that Immolation does is utilize very short passages uh, and then smash them up against longer passages to give that, that semblance of like a chaotic build. They usually will have like riffs in three or riffs in six and then put them up against a longer passage to give that passage more of a feeling that you can get lost in Whereas before you have this like tribal nature or like a ritualistic nature to these short passages that really have a lot of a lot of build to them. And that's what's going on at the end of this record here. So what you have that is the uh, penultimate riff of the song is this. <laughs> and eventually they add um, really nasty uh, one note higher than an octave kind of harmony to it. So it's like. So very short, 
very kind of tribal feeling uh, build up type of riff and then it just kind of uh, gets bumped right up against the last riff of the song which you're used you're used to the tonic being that open C the, now the last riff of the song starts at D and there's there's successful ways to do that this just goes from from one to the other without any transition at all so what you end up having having is So everything stops there. The rhythm, uh, the rhythm section completely drops out. Then you have um, this high guitar passage. And then the, everything comes in with kind of like a black metal feeling like minor chord passage. while that high guitar is going on over the top. It's a very, very cool riff. I love the riff. I love it as an outro to the record. It's very morose and sinister sounding, but you have all of this build and, and it just really culminates in something that you think is going to be really grandiose. And then the train just completely derails to set up an entirely new passage. So there's, there's multitudes of ways they could have made this work, but they chose to just slam it right up against each other and it doesn't have any kind of flow it doesn't have like um a narrative quality where one melody line leads to the next in a successful way the two riffs do not enhance each other by being smashed up against each other so it's really puzzling why they would go ahead to end the record this way but it is what it is. It's it's what happens when you just don't give enough thought to the, the the segments of the song that you're trying to piece together. You know, you could have went at it and said, "I okay, I have this really grandiose feeling, uh, morose, triumphant riff at the end, uh, but I need to build to it successfully." To me, it felt like they had this riff and they might have wanted to use it before in another record, and they were just like, "Fuck it, throw it on there." And that showcases that you don't have it fully fleshed out. You don't have a fully fleshed out vision for your song or for your record if you're just kind of pulling things out of a, out of a hat and you know throwing it at the wall and seeing if it works. And you know this is this is what most modern bands are guilty of: having great riffs, not understanding how to go from A to Z effectively, how to take the listener on a journey that is logical and still has like normal peaks and valleys in an organic way uh and and lends itself to the greater whole a lot of bands aren't focusing on, the, the, on that they're focusing on cool riffs and clever riffs and dexterous riffs and here we have a band that's not focusing on that they knew they had strong passages but there wasn't thought into how to put them together to conclude the record so that one always stuck out to me so now that I've given you those examples, you could see just a couple of different uh, ideas where transitions either greatly helped the song or their lack thereof harmed the song. And you know, the, like, I, like I've honed in on in many videos, uh, the easiest way to spot whether you need it is if the flow is off. You know, flow is very important, but it's not the only thing. There are examples of songs, as I mentioned before in the intro of this video, where the tempo feels good, one part leads to the next, and there's other examples I can think of that I can make another video of if you need it. Uh, but the notes leap out of a register where it feels gimmicky, and you, you, it still will flow. Like the drums, if you were to keep playing the same rhythm, it's still going to feel right, uh, but it's, it, it's, it's unnecessary and it feels like it leaps out of character for the song. And songs don't need to be monochromatic either, but you have to make sure that when you're putting things together that there is utility to each part. Why is this riff like this? Why is the next riff like that? If you're gonna put a transition in between them, what is the use of that? Do it, does it make it so that two riffs that don't go together now fit? And if it does, why did you decide to do that if you knew that you didn't have a strong enough arrangement that really relied on a transition to put it together maybe you should have went back to the drawing board and i tend to not try to in my writing and, and like i said purely anecdotal 
I try not to have transitions be the linchpin of the arrangement in such a way where if they were to disappear, the song would completely not be functional. And you have to make sure that the value of all of your parts, it's not, not equal. You want to make sure that they build on each other in a way where they give each other relevance. But I don't come into a song with segments of the song that I feel don't carry as much weight as the next. I make sure that everything that I'm doing, at least in the way that I've put it together, all needs to be there or it's going to fall apart. So it, it, a lot of people will use transitions as a band-aid in their songs, and that's not the way I like to use them. I like to use them to lead the audience on a journey, either melodically, thematically, um, and, or you know, plenty of other other, it, you, can, you can have a transition do anything you want for the song, as long as you do it in a way where it serves the song. And that, you know, that's a very abstract idea. It's hard to fully discern what I'm saying. It would require many more examples to show you guys, and I don't have a problem doing that. I just have a laundry list of shit that I want to get to today. So I'm just going to give you these examples, give you this idea. And, and like I said, this is not the only thing that I'm judging bands on I'm not just saying oh this doesn't flow together so it's fucking garbage that's not true at all I, I look at every single thing that I'm hearing when I when I look at a band and I decide from there whether or not it's artistically valid so if you're coming to me without an emotional template to what you're doing if it's coming across as just something you felt like doing that day and it doesn't have a voice behind it that's going to be first and foremost why I'm going to be criticizing your composition because that element of the lack of compassion to your, to your art will come through in your arrangement even if you don't intend to, it, uh, intend to have it happen that way. Um, so there's plenty of things that I look at in a song when I'm analyzing it. This is just one thing. And in, you know, I think that Chuck Schuldiner was a very passionate writer he just didn't understand structuring and he didn't have a grasp on how to make his great riffs tie together to serve a song's purpose and, and thusly to serve an album's purpose. So, so yeah, I mean, transitions, very vital, very important, very useful. And you shouldn't go into a song thinking that you need them to get your composition to work. But if you're going to use them, like I said, make sure it has utility and there's infinite ways to give it utility. If it's just there as a band-aid, it's not utility. It's a crutch. So thank you guys for listening. I can make a follow-up video if you want some more examples of this. And uh, once again, I like having you guys all around. It's, it's great that we have our own little community here, the people that have been commenting you know, on every video I make and look forward to what I'm doing. That's awesome. It's cool that we have our little round table. So let's keep talking about it. Let's talk about things that work in metal and why we don't see them anymore and uh, ways that bands could possibly focus on them to make the genre great again. It would be cool to see it happen. So uh, yeah, thank you for listening.